a brief of the Ten Commandments. Have thou no other gods but me, unto no image bow thy knee. Take not the name of God in vain, nor Sabbath day do thou profane. Honor thy father and mother too, and see that thou no murder do. From whoredom keep thee pure and clean, and steal not though thy state be mean. See that thou no false witness bear, and covet not thy neighbor's gear. O Lord, our souls to thee convert, and write thy laws into our heart. Hello and welcome everybody to another video from Jörg, Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This is part two of the reading Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil, a book written by Martin Luther and published in 1545, his last book, as you know. Last time we read between the beginning uh, of the book from on page 263 to the bottom of page 270 for the ones who are going to read along in their own copy because that is why I provide the link where you can get the book in the description box of the video. So without any further ado I want to go in there because you know I have many comments <laughs> probably and um, I don't want to lose any time but get along with the reading for about an hour from now. So on the bottom of page 70 on the last paragraph Martin Luther writes The princes and estates of the empire also use the word quote-unquote Christian with simple upright intent to be a council in which one should act on Christian affairs through Christian people according to the scriptures for they knew full well how the Pope in his canon uh, in his canon law had dealt with belts, gowns, shoes, cassocks tungers, church dedications, Easter cake blessings, benefices, prelates and pallia, dignities and countless follies. Instead, since weighty important matters and disputations are being prepared about indulgences, purgatory, the mass, idolatry, faith, good works and things like that, one should settle such things in Christian fashion, according to Holy Scripture, not in papal fashion, and help the poor simple man to know just where he stands, and what, <coughs> sorry, and what should finally become of his soul. Yes, this in German, Latin, Greek, or any other language, this means Christian counsel. The Pope and his hellish scum smelled this quite well, not even having a cold, but he took sneeze powder to give himself a cold, and thus distorted this word Christian thusly. And I'll follow a little quote that I'm going to read to you within a second. I just want to go back into this few little words that I've just read. What few little words? <laughs> Instead... Since weighty important matters and disputations are being prepared about indulgences, purgatory, the mass, idolatry, faith, good works and things like that, one should settle such things in Christian fashion. Now, I'm going to ask you, what is the Christian fashion to settle things like indulgences, purgatory, the Mass, Idolatry, Faith, Good Works. Any answer? Well, in my humble opinion, Indulgences, Purgatory, the Mass, Idolatry are all things addressed in the Bible in a very certain way. And they can only be disclosed by the Bible in the very certain way, as all pagan, all heathen traditions. Faith is explained in the Bible, good works are explained in the Bible, and good works are, in very stark contrast to the opinion of the Roman Catholic Church, according to the Bible, the fruit of a saved Christian, whereas a Roman Catholic needs good works to get saved. And those things absolutely need to be settled. 
but I can tell you right now, there will never come a council discussing all these things, not in this depth and not even addressing purgatory, indulgences, the Mass, because the Mass, the Roman Catholic Mass with its transubstantiation is a pillar of the Roman Catholic Church. And they will never even start to discuss a pillar of their dogma. No, they won't. Take my word for it. Now, Martin Luther says, and thus distorted this word Christian thusly. Quote, quote unquote, Christian is to mean nothing more than papal. <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, we got that sorted out. And what his hellishness, including his school of scoundrels, God forgive me, I almost said, including his holy church, in Rome, judge and conclude. Anything undertaken against this should be unchristian and heretical. Namely, if the council wished to conclude that one should freely administer the sacrament in both kinds, as the heretics want to do, it must be condemned by the council at the command of its lord the pope. And those who had planned to bring it up in the council should, as heretics, not be admitted, as the hellish father writes to the emperor. Quote, the heretics should have no place in the council and no part in the holy church. Now, I have to get a little bit into this little sentence because some one <laughs> is the right word one easily reads above this few little quote unquote harmless words and doesn't understand it very well it says the sacrament in both kinds yeah? if the council wished to conclude that one should freely administer the sacrament in both kinds as the heretics want to do what is Martin Luther addressing here well, if you ever have been part of a Mass in the Roman Catholic Church, you know that in the Bible is called communion, breaking the bread and drinking the wine in remembrance of Jesus Christ. And the Roman Catholic Church is a part of the Mass. It is called the dogma of the transubstantiation. And they are giving the bread to the lay people, but they are not giving the cup with sharing the quote-unquote blood. To Jesus, uh, of Jesus Christ to the lay people. Now, first and for all, the Roman Catholic Church damns, curses, anathemas, everybody who says, uh, according to Jesus Christ, when he says, do this in remembrance of me, when you are doing that in the dogma of the transubstantiation in the Roman Catholic Church, in the Mass, you are damned, you are cursed, you are anathema. All right? First and for all. And second for all, when you say, well, in the Bible, they take both uh, quote-unquote sacraments, because I even don't like the word sacrament here, but they take both kinds of the communion, as it is called in the Bible, the taking part of the Holy Communion, sharing the breaking bread and the wine and the cu uh, of the cup of the blood of Jesus Christ. In the Roman Catholic Church, they only give you one part. Because the Roman Catholic Church is of the opinion that when you spill a drop of that what is in the cup, that is sacrilege. You know? Because this is to them not doing it in remembrance, as Jesus Christ told us, but to them it is the actual blood of the Savior. And therefore it is an absolute sacrilege if a drop maybe could stay in your beard while drinking it, or a drop could fall down. And that's why in the Roman Catholic Church, at least at that time, I don't know how it is today because I don't go to Roman Catholic Masses, but at that time, the sacrament of the bread and wine during the Mass was only given in one kind. Means 
they were only given the bread. And I read to you in the very first uh, part, I think, that uh, when we were speaking about this council, that the quote-unquote heretics are asking for uh, both kinds to do, as they did in Bohemia, I think. I read that to you a few pages ago. Read it again if you missed that. Okay? So the point is that we read here the heretics should have no place in the council and no part in the Holy Church who ask for the quote-unquote sacrament of both kinds. And if the heretics, he continues, were to rebuke the emperor, saying that God the Father had, through his dear son, instituted such an article, and had commanded all the world to hear his son, as we can read in Luke 3, verse 22, hear him, and that the Holy Spirit had maintained it in the whole of Christendom until the Pope forbade it in the 1400s, that the majority of Christendom, which is not subject to the Pope, still keeps this article concerning heretics and will continue to keep it until the end of the world, in spite of all the emperors should burn, kill and drive out all the heretics that keep this with God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit and Christians of all the world, even those in India, Persia and the whole Orient. This is the reason. God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, including His Holy Church, are heretics and unchristian. Only the Pope and his Roman school of scoundrels are Christians. Now it is really much better that God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, together with His Holy Church, are condemned as miserable heretics by the Council, than that the hellish Father Pope and his hermaphrodites should be called unchristian. Unchristian heretical views like this and many more are taught and held by God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit in His Holy Church. For example, it is held that there is no purgatory, since the hellish father in Rome has invented it for a fair and has stolen unlimited money and property with it, you know, to prevent people to go to purgatory or to help your beloved deceased uh, brethren from family or whatever to get out of purgatory you could buy indulgences uh, we are speaking about uh, the end of the 15th and the beginning of the 16th century where the sell of indulgences a kind of simony went rampant on Europe because the Pope needed the money to build St. Peter's the church that you see today at the Vatican yeah? it had for it, uh, it, Rome has invented it, the purgatory, for a fair and has stolen unlimited money and property with purgatory. Again, Martin Luther continues, again it is held that indulgences are a filthy fraud with which the hellish father has made fools of and defrauded all the world. Again it is held that the Mass is a sacrifice for the living and the dead, that the estate of marriage is free, and many more of these things upon which the papacy now bases itself. I will not mention simony, greed, trading with benefices, pederastry, and other things the Holy See in Rome does and enjoys doing in its most holy life, all of which the Holy Spirit, that unchristian heretic, and his church condemn to the utmost, and cannot bear to hear mentioned. It follows from this that God, especially the Holy Spirit, who, it is claimed, assembles the councils and directs all their dealings and decisions, cannot come to the Council of Trent or to any papal council, and will have to stay out. Now, the reason. The Holy Virgin, St. Paula III, meaning the Holy Virgin Antichrist, Pope Paul III, writes to Emperor Charles V that the heretics should have neither part nor place in his holy free Christian council. Now it has been shown that God, the Holy Spirit, is an abominable arch-heretic 
as well as God the Father and Son, because against papal and Roman holiness he has instituted and ordained and still today keeps and teaches the administration of his very holy sacrament in both kinds in his churches and condemns those who do not keep it or do it in this way, all of which is contrary and hateful to the hellish see in Rome, who has frequently condemned this as heresy through his bulls, for as his apologists write, he has also become a powerful lord and judge over scripture and over God's word, able to change what God has instituted and commanded. Yes, that is the point of the Roman Catholic Church. It puts the Pope above Scripture. Whereas Protestants, real Bible-believing Christians, say, say sola scriptura, the Bible and the Bible alone, the Roman Catholic Church says the Bible and the Bible alone, and above the Bible, the traditions of the Church and the decrees of the Pope. Because the Pope is above the Bible. He has the power to change it. Uh, I think, I think that when you open the Bible at a certain place, you will read that whoever takes away or adds to this word will experience the plagues. And his name will not be written in the, name, uh, in the book of life. All right? But the Roman Catholic Church teaches that the Lord is a powerful Lord, that the, that the Pope is a powerful Lord and judge over Scripture and over God's Word, able to change what God has instituted and commanded. So, in other words, when you are listening to the Pope, you are not listening to God. You cannot have it both ways. So the question is, who do you pay your allegiance to? Man, the Pope, a cardinal, a bishop, a priest, a deacon, doesn't matter, anyone of the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, or the Creator God, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and his wonderful Son, who has died for you on the cross and shed his blood for the forgiveness of your sins. That's the question. Who do you adhere to? You cannot have it both ways, people. There is no gray zone in between white and black. And white is white and black is black. The truth is the truth and a lie is a lie. And when the Pope says of himself that he is able to change what God has instituted and commanded, I just, I, I don't even discuss it. I just want Biblical proof. That's the same point that Martin Luther made when he was, in 1521, before the Edict of Worms in Germany, to defend his writings, among that the, the writing of the Christian nobility, the writing of the Babylonian captivity of the Church, and other writings. He stood there, and Martin Luther said, If I cannot be proven wrong by Scripture... I cannot and I will not recant. If you cannot prove by scripture that a man is able to change what God had instituted and commanded and by that overrides it and make it his word, and that is the word that counts, if you cannot prove that by scripture to me, well, I think that you are a liar. And that exactly is the problem with the Roman Catholic Church. It is a lying church. Have you ever seen the Pope on television or in real life having a Bible in his hand? Opening the Bible and reading and preaching from it, reading and explaining from it, quote-unquote his word, because he says he's, he's God on earth. Did you ever... I have never. I think that's probably because he never does. Because the Pope hates God's word. He loves his own words. And that's why he says he is able to change what God has instituted and commanded. 
Now, what has God instituted? What has God instituted? Sorry, I had to cough here. God has instituted certain um, certain rules and certain certain ordinations. God has ordained something, and the Pope takes it and turns it all around. I mean, this is what the book says here, and this is what not only Martin Luther in this book says. This is actually that when you follow Roman Catholic canon law, you can read for yourself. It is the same like Jesus Christ said to the Pharisees in that time. You shut up the kingdom of heaven for the normal man because of your traditions. Yeah? You don't teach the word of God, but you teach your traditions. And the same Pharisees are today in the Roman Catholic Church. But again, let's continue. Now there would probably be help and counsel available so that the Holy Spirit, the poor arch-heretic, might come to grace and be admitted into the holy, free and Christian council, which we know is bound, unholy and Roman Catholic, if he were not so stiff-necked and would humble himself, fall on his knees before the Holy Virgin St. Paula III, Madam Pope, and kiss her sweet feet, confess his heresy then and there, repent and recant. He would undoubtedly receive a bull of indulgence without charge and absolutely free for both himself and his holy church. But St. Paul, also a great heretic who confused the whole world in Acts 17, verse 6, as the Jews in Thessalonica screamed about him, says in Romans 11, verse 29, the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. That is, he will change, for the, he will change them for no one's sake. This same heretic Paul also confuses the Holy Spirit so that he must remain unrepentant and can find neither grace nor forgiveness for his sin and penitent, um, uh, sorry, cannot find neither grace nor forgiveness for his sin and heresy. That is why he will just have to stay out of the holy, free, Christian council of the holy Madam Pope Paula III. He may, meanwhile, duck and hide himself in his own heretical church, so that Paula III does not catch him. Otherwise, he would surely have to be burned to ashes as an arch-heretic. St. Paula, the Holy Virgin Pope, will no doubt find a better, more beautiful, much more Christian, freer and holier spirit in his holy, free Christian council. Do you see how Luther is mocking the Roman Catholic Church? He is sarcastic. And he is mocking the Roman Catholic Church as the Roman Catholic Church is mocking God. He does to them what they do to God. This is so interesting in this reading. Of course, Luther is very serious. But Luther has a kind of a humor that people should rediscover today, especially when they talk about things like this. In my humble opinion, <laughs> in my humble opinion, we should even use the power of humor, the power of sarcastics, to expose the Roman Catholic Church for the Antichrist that he is. It is so blatant in the eye to all to see, for all of us, how, what's the right word, how idiotic almost, the Roman Catholic Church acts compared to the Bible. Everybody who has ever put up a Bible only for a few minutes in his life can tell just like this that the Roman Catholic Church is a joke, cannot be Christian, cannot be the Church of Christ. And Luther uses sarcasm and marking the Roman Catholic Church to show this. And I hope that during my reading, 
you can get that sarcasm out of what I am reading. Especially when he writes, St. Paula, the Holy Virgin Pope, will no doubt find a better, more beautiful, much more Christian, freer and holier spirit in his Holy, Free and Christian Council. Do you know what Holy Spirit the Pope finds? The spirit of the devil. That's the one that he finds. The spirit of the God of this earth, as in the New Testament it is said, that the prince of the air is the God of this world, Satan. That is the spirit, the quote-unquote St. Paula, Holy Virgin Pope, finds here. Well, the Pope is no more virgin than I am. And I can prove that I'm not a virgin because I have a son. <laughs> The Pope is a fornicator. The Pope is a pederast, a pedophile, a sodomite, an idolater. And Martin Luther is getting his humor with him right here. I don't know how that expression goes in German. We have, we have a good expression on, uh, on this. I don't know what that's in English. So I'm just saying that he drives his jokes around the Pope around here. And I hope that you get that from the expression, the way that I'm reading this book. Wonderful work against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil. Now Luther continues, Someone may think here that I am satisfying my own desire with such scornful, wounding, stinging words to the Pope. Oh, <laughs> Believe it or not, I have not read the sentence before. I have not read this book before in English. I only read it in German. <laughs> so, when I was just giving this comment about this mockery and about his satire and sarcastic, sarcastic writing, I did not read the sentence, believe you me. <laughs> now, someone may think here that I am satisfying my own desire with such scornful, wounding, stinging words to the Pope. O oh Lord God, I am far, far too insignificant to deride the Pope. For over six hundred years now, he has undoubtedly derided the world, and has laughed up his sleeve at its corruption and body, in body and soul, goods and honor. He does not stop, and he cannot stop, as St. Peter calls him, in Second Peter 2, insatiable for sin. No man can believe that what an abomination the papacy is. No man can believe what an abomination the papacy is, even though there is proof all around every day, especially in our day, where every word the Pope utters is written down and published, and you can read it, and then you can hold it against Holy Scripture. But no man, no man can believe what an abomination the papacy is. No, you, you, we, we, we just don't get it. It's not possible. How can you be such an abomination and then be the ruler of the world, the replacement of Jesus Christ? How is that possible? Well, the answer is simple. It's not. No man can believe what an abomination the papacy is. A Christian does not have to be of low intelligence, either to recognize it. <laughs> God himself must deride him in the hellish fire and our Lord Christ St. Paul says in Second Thessalonians 2 verse 8 will slay him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by his glorious coming I only deride with my weak derision so that those who now live and those who will come after us should know what I have thought of the Pope, the damned Antichrist, and so that whoever wishes to be a Christian may be warned against such an abomination. Now this is one of the most important sentences, I think, and this is one of the sentences I used in the German reading to put in my video over and over again, this little quote by Martin Luther. I'm going to repeat it once again, because here, for the very first time, we, hear, we, hear, uh, we, we read Martin Luther speak expressly of the Pope being the Antichrist, without covering 
any words, without taking any honey on his lips before speaking. Quote, I only deride with my weak derision, so that those who now live in the 16th century as contemporaries of Martin Luther, and those who will come after us, that is us today, among others, will, uh, should know what I have thought of the Pope, the damned Antichrist, and so that whoever wishes to be a Christian may be warned against such an abomination. How can you be more clear than this? I think you can't. Martin Luther gives us a warning that is even more secure than the warning of 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 8, where it says that our Lord will slay him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by his glorious coming. When we read there before, of course, in 2 Thessalonians 2, that he who now let us must be taken out of the way, and then that Antichrist will be revealed, that son of perdition, that man of sin. Even clearer than that, Martin Luther is in this sentence, when he says what I have thought of the Pope, the damned Antichrist, and so that whoever wishes to be a Christian may be warned against such an abomination. So don't call yourself Christian when you are joining the Church of Antichrist. And not only because Martin Luther says it, but Martin Luther just quoted the Bible. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8. 2 Thessalonians 2 is a work that I'm going to take on with Tom Fress. I don't know when. Um, today is the 22nd of October and I asked Tom, I think uh, a little bit more than a week ago, if he would make some time, some time with me to read with me Second Thessalonians 2, the complete chapter of the Bible, of the New Testament. Because this is absolutely necessary to understand, to have the rightful understanding of that the papacy is the Antichrist. There is no future Antichrist. Don't look for an Antichrist in some distant future, and some seventh year tribulation, and some rapture, which is all unbiblical. And you understand that when you read Daniel chapter 2, chapter 7, when you read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, when you read Revelation chapter 13, 17, 18, everything is clear. And therefore I asked Tom, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update to do with me a reading of 2 Thessalonians 2. And he agreed. I don't know when he has the time, and I together with him to do that. But that will surely come in the future. But in the meantime we have Martin Luther, who cites here 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8, will slay him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by his glorious coming. Then Martin Luther says, I only deride with my weak derision, so that those who now live and those who will come after us, because they have the knowledge of reading books like this, should know what I have thought of the Pope, the damned Antichrist, and so that Whoever wishes to be a Christian may be warned against such an abomination. When you call yourself a Christian, then come out of the Antichrist Church. Simple as that. When you call yourself a Christian who says, the Bible and the Bible alone, that is my authority, then also adhere to it. Also practice what you say. Put your words, uh, put your, uh, works where your mouth is, or how do they say that? Right? Very, very important sentence. What I have thought of the Pope, the damned Antichrist. Here for the very first time in this book we have it written without any other words in pure and simple English, the damned Antichrist, the Pope. Now Martin Luther continues. He distorts, and we are still, don't forget, we are still in this introduction to the book. <laughs> He distorts and tortures the third word, German, or in German lands, in this way. Emperor Charles V is to see to it that no weapon is to be feared, that is, there should be peace and no war to fear. The arms should be withdrawn. 
Now the Roman scoundrel knows very well that Emperor Charles V, together with his brother Ferdinand, and we are talking here about Ferdinand had been king of Austria since 1521, in 1556 he succeeded Charles, and his title became Ferdinand I. So with his brother King Ferdinand and all the German princes are so powerful that he can keep peace only in one city, Trent, but also in all of Germany. His scoundrel Paula knows it well, I say, but he warns him of a danger that exists nowhere, so that the council cannot be held. At the time, he blames Emperor Charles and the German princes that no council can be held as though it were not his fault, but that of the Emperor and estates of the Empire who do not provide either peace or security because they do not lay down their sword or armor, but these neither are nor can be at hand. At the same time he blames Emperor Charles and the German princes that no council can be held as though it were not his fault, but that of the Emperor and estates of the Empire who do not provide either peace or security because they do not lay down their sword or armor, but these neither are nor can be at hand. The German princes could not start any council because only the Pope says he wants a council. And the German princes acknowledged in the Augsburg Confession of the Protestants in 1530 the Protestant belief that is called heretic by the Roman Catholic Church. So why the Pope is blaming here the German princes, I do not know. Because he says that these quote-unquote heretics aren't even allowed to be in the council. And that they should lay down their sword or armor. Well, the sword or armor of a righteous man in this time of life, at that time Luther speaks here about, a true Christian is the word of God, the Bible. And that could not be at hand. Now with these words he obling obligingly, sorry, with these words he obligingly confesses that he never wants to hold a council in the German lands. That's the point. Every excuse the Pope uses comes right back at him. Because they are all excuses. They are lies. For when, <clears throat> for when will there be a time when a Pope cannot invent or allege that it would be dangerous if the armor is not put aside? Even if the Emperor would have him accompanied on the highway by 100,000 men on both sides, he would still say, yes, but who can trust them? But if the Emperor does not do it, the complaint would be that it is dangerous and not safe, that the way the Emperor is doing it, he still cannot protect the Pope, and so the armor or armaments will remain an eternal obstacle to a council, which the Emperor, even if there were a hundred Emperors, could not remove. The meaning of putting aside armor or keeping armor, of free or unfree, of Christian or unchristian lies in the will and power of the hellish Pope. Such words also provide many other excuses, which cannot be counted, but which the hellish father can daily invent with his mind. I shall touch upon several. He can undoubtedly drum up several men and horses at this time who can raise an alarm that enemies are at hand, creating a dangerous situation. For instance, the Turks have twice been his cover. That is a reference to Pope Paul's hesitation to hold the council at Mantua and Vicenza earlier than the Council of Trent that was then held in 1545. Or he can fall ill. Oh, who will worry about the devil finding excuses and ways out? But this 
is his very best one. He can goad France against the Empire any time, as he did most diligently in the last twenty years, particularly when the Council was due to start. Then he can claim, Ah, Lord God, how gladly we would hold the Council, but because our two sons, the Emperor and the King of France, are at odds, we cannot manage it. This is just what he is doing now, when in his bull he signs of his great joy that the two rulers are reconciled and calls for a council in Trent. But, O oh Lord God, how sorry the hellish father is that France does not keep the treaty and the split become wider than before. Excuses, excuses, excuses all along for not holding a council. From this we can understand that the word of the hellish father in Rome, you are to lay down your arms, is as much as saying, you, Emperor Charles, are to see that there is peace. You are not only to put aside your sword, but you are also to see that France puts its aside. Which, is neither can, which it neither can nor should do. For it is our wish that France give you unrest for ever and ever. That is why, before we hold a council, you, Charles, shall always put out fires, and France shall always light them. You know, when reading this, you just really understand where this quote-unquote hatred that comes between the German and the France. Uh, the French. When, when I grew up, I understood that the German and the French were quote-unquote arch-enemies, even though I had a very nice friend called Eric Belando, who lived in Paris or somewhere in the surroundings there, and had a German grandmother who we visited some times a year, and she lived in the same house that I lived when I grew up as a child. And I became friends with Eric, and I didn't care that he was French. He spoke German enough so that we could play together, and we had fun together. But even today, if you ask a lot of people on the German streets, they will say that the German and the French are arch enemies. The question is why? And here you can even say that, uh, you can even see that. Because in this quote we see that it is the Pope stirring up hate and war between the Germans and the French. Between the rulers of Germany and the rulers of France, not the people. The people love each other. But the Pope stirs up the leaders, and the leaders put out their armies, and then there is war. That is what the Jesuits do all the time since they have been inaugurated in 1540. They control all the wars on the top. And this is exactly what Martin Luther writes about here in this book. So I'm going to repeat this little sentence that I read, and I want you to read it with the understanding that the Pope is sowing hatred between Germany and France, right here as we read it. Quote, You, Emperor Charles, are to see that there is peace. You are not only to put aside your sword, but you are also to see that France puts its aside, which it neither can nor should do. For it is our, the Pope's wish, that France gives you unrest for ever and ever. That is why, before we hold a council, you, Charles, shall always put out fires, and France shall always light them. And if France should get lazy in this, then we ourselves shall blow on it and blow it up, so that you always have something to extinguish and finally get tired of extinguishing. This is how we shall teach you and your German swine to covet a council from the Roman sea, and still we shall continue to boast, have the arms withdrawn, have the arms withdrawn, when you establish peace, we shall grant a council which will and shall happen when we stop warmongering, which shall never happen. Unquote. The Pope says this. Okay? 
for you are to lay down your arms. The Pope says, have the arms withdrawn when you establish peace, you emperor establish peace, and by that getting the terms right for starting a council, when you establish peace, we, the Roman Catholic Church, shall grant a council which will and shall happen when we stop warmongering. When we stop warmongering, warmongering, which shall never happen. The Roman Catholic Church will never start, stop with warmongering. That is the lesson that we can take out of this little sentence Martin Luther writes here. And that's the way it is. You know, the people always say, how can the Pope be so powerful? He has no army. No, he has no army, but he controls all the armies of the world, because he controls all the leaders of the world. And the Pope here says that he controls the German Emperor, and that he controls the King of France, and that he will take care of that there will be fires and fires and fires, that there will be war and war and war, that there will come no peace, and that therefore there will come no council, except for his conditions. And that's what the Council of Trent eventually was. It was a council on the conditions of the Pope. It was a council on the conditions of the new founded Jesuit order. That's why in three sessions, split over 18 years, 125 some anathemas were spoken against the heretics. The quote-unquote heretics. The Protestants. I hope you get me. The Pope is the one who warmongers, and it will never happen. War, uh, it will never happen that he stops warmongering. Now you can see, Martin Luther continues, what a rascally answer the emperor and estates have been given to their plea, which they have now made for twenty-four years for a free Christian council in Germany. Because those Roman rascals zealously apply themselves, as they have always done, confusing the languages, so that the rascal in Rome answers in gibberish. Whereas the emperor and estates speak exact German or Latin, they will never agree on language, to say nothing about being able to convene a council. Doesn't this mean drumming on the emperors and the state's snouts as one drums on the snouts of fools? The rascals laugh up their sleeves over this, and at the same time scold and slander the emperor with the very same words as though he had looked for a captive, unchristian, unsafe council, but that they were the most holy people who wanted a free, Christian, safe council. Thus, the pious emperor and the estates of the empire now have to have a reputation with the rascals in Rome of having wanted and of still looking for a forced, captive, compelled, unchristian, heretical, dangerous and troublesome council. This is the way to scrape off the tongue and horns of an emperor and an empire. Now plead once more to the Most Holy Father for a council. Again, very, very important sentence. The rascals laugh up their sleeves over this, and at the same time scold and slander the Emperor with the very same words as though he had looked for a captive, unchristian, unsafe council, but that they were the most holy people who wanted a free Christian and safe council. Thus, the pious emperor and the estates of the empire now have to have the reputation with the rascals in Rome of having wanted and of still looking for a forced, captive, compelled, unchristian, heretical, dangerous and troublesome council. Well, with this few words, a forced, captive, compelled, unchristian, heretical, dangerous and troublesome council, 
the Council of Trent is perfectly described from the point of view of a Bible-believing Christian. Because that council was forced in its decisions that were made, the anathemas against Bible-believing Christians, that council, people were taken captive of their conscience, that council was unchristian, that council was heretical in the sense of anti-biblical, because that is what a heretic, according to the Bible, is. Someone who does not accept the Bible and the Word of God. Of course, the Roman Catholic Church turns that around and says, he is a heretic who does not adhere to Roman Catholic canon law, who does not adhere to the Pope and the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. The Council of Trent was dangerous and it was a very, very troublesome council. And the decisions that have been made at that council we still experience today. 2017. Now plead once more to the Most Holy Father for a council. <laughs> but not a council like that. Some people think the Cardinal of Mainz has perpetrated this rascality, but I don't believe it. It would be much too inferior an example of his craft. He would do it much better, for it seems to me that he is the real master, even over those in Rome. Those in Rome have been practiced and well versed in such rascality and roguery for over 400 years now as one can see from the Pope's decretals and all the histories of emperors. Just look how the poor lawyers are plagued, patching, unifying and smoothing the Roman rascality with glosses before they can give it any sort of shape. It is just as though a furrier patched up a bad pelt on which neither the skin nor the fur is any good, and which is moreover full of spit, pus and excrement. Very well, let it continue as long as it can. The emperor and the empire must swallow this kind of rascality. This is not the first emperor with whom the incorrigible rascal in Rome has played like that. They have not spared a single one since they came to power. Maximilian I, the predecessor of Charles V, who reigned between 15, uh, 1493 and 1519, Maximilian's greatest complaint was that no pope had ever kept faith with him. I should think this Emperor Charles V has truly experienced the same thing with Antichrist Pope Clement VII. And about that we read in a footnote that Clement VII, who reigned between 1523 and 34, opposed the election of Charles V. Luther frequently mentioned the story that comes now. So, listen up. I should think this Emperor Charles V has truly experienced the same thing with Antichrist Pope Clement VII, Leo X, and now Paul III. In summary, they are all the creatures and heirs of the Emperor Phocas, who first established the papacy in Rome, and whom they loyally follow. This same Phocas, as a regicide in Constantinople, murdered his lord, the Emperor Maurice, and his wife and children. This is a story that Martin Luther uh, will tell or will mention frequently, and uh, we are going to page 90 for an example of where he mentioned that. So that's in another part of the book. You can read that on page 90. And there we read, the bickering went on until Phocas became emperor. He had had the pious emperor Maurice, whom history calls a saint, his predecessor and lord. Phocas had been his captain. He had him beheaded, together with his wife and children. This godly Cain confirmed the supremacy of Bishop Boniface, Boniface III, that is, of Rome over all other bishops. 
Now, this is very interesting. We read here in a little footnote, in 602, Phocas beheaded a revolution in Constantinople which deposed the ruler of the eastern half of the Roman Empire, Maurice I, who had been on the throne since 582. He and his entire family were put to death. Pope Gregory I, who reigned between 590 and 604, hailed the revolution as an act of God against the tyrant. Phocas was emperor until 610, when he was deposed and killed in another revolution, headed by Heraclius. We can read that from Schaefer. Uh, very interesting works that Schaefer did. But the point that I want to make is the following. Boniface III was bishop for only eight months. He had been Rome's diplomatic representative for Constantinople and a friend of Phocas. So, this godly cane, Phocas, confirmed the supremacy of Bishop Boniface over Rome, of Rome over all other bishops. This is the point that is very important. Because here, Martin Luther bases on, on this historical fact, and there are many things to add to this, that the 1260-year reign of the Antichrist started in 606 and not as the Seventh-day Adventist Church teaches in 538. In 606, the Emperor Phocas gave the Bishop Boniface, who was at then Bishop of Rome, not Pope, he was a Bishop, he gave him the supremacy over all the other bishops in the Western and Eastern Church. That was the time when that Bishop of Rome got to hold the title Pontifex Maximus again. That was the beginning of the supreme, let's call it, spiritual and temporal power of the Bishop of Rome. Now, the bishop before him that we've just read about, that um, Gregory, Gregory made a statement that when there comes a bishop who claims to be bishop of all the bishops, all the bishops of the West, all the bishops of the East, that he will be the Antichrist. That is what Bishop Gregory or Pope Gregory said. So the title of Pope actually began because of Phocas, who made Boniface III the bishops of all bishops. And this kind of supremacy, the book continues here, we are reading, of course, in the book now on the councils and the church. Um, and this kind of supremacy could have been justly certified by no better man than this by the shameful murderer of an emperor. So Rome had as good a beginning of papacy as its empire had previously had when Romulus murdered, murdered his brother Remus so that he could rule alone and, the name, and name the city after himself. Nevertheless, the bishops of Constantinople paid no attention to this, and the squabble continued on and on, although the Roman bishops, meanwhile, embellished the emperor Phocas' certification with fig leaves, and screamed loudly with great bellowing, in, like in Revelation 12, that the Church of Rome was supreme, not by human command, but by Christ's own institution. Matthew 16. Something that we will see in the future. So I went to this page 90 to inform you about the point that Luther wants to make, because he says that the papacy was actually founded by Emperor Phocas. This is very important for us to understand, because the teaching that is going all through the world in this case today is always the teaching of the Seventh-day Adventist Church who teach that the 1260 prophetic days, the three and a half years or the 42 months of the reign of the Antichrist had that time between 538 and 1798. Martin Luther, with his understanding of history before there was any Seventh-day Adventist, Alexander Hislop had the same understanding and he did not adhere to Seventh-day Adventist teaching when he wrote his book The Two Babylons 
in the 1850s, and also Henry Gretton Guinness, when he wrote Romanism and the Reformation, held to the point that Emperor Phocas, the regicide in Constantinople, murdered his lord, Emperor Maurice, and his wife and children. He was the one who gave the power to Pope or Bishop Boniface the the, the third, and with that, this Boniface the, the, the third actually became the first pope. All the quote-unquote popes before Boniface III were just bishops of Rome. But Phocas, who was the emperor at that time, gave the power to the pope. So, this is another very important point that Martin Luther makes when we go into our next readings, of course, and in the whole book. The pope claims that he has divine authority given to him by Jesus Christ among others in Matthew 16 that we will go extensively over in this book but actually he got his power from an emperor focus and this is why everything that we read up to now is so very interesting because it is historically proven that the Pope got his power by the emperor and now exalts himself above the emperor like we are talking about here, the Pope is master of the emperors, the councils, and even the angels. That's what we are talking about here. But we have reached an hour, and I will come to a conclusion, so that next time we will start on the top of page 277, or on the bottom of page 276, read this one again, and reflect about it. Get your own copy of this book and do your own study. The study, the, the, the teaching of the Seventh-day Adventist Church that the 1260 year reign of the Antichrist was from 538 to 1798 is a false teaching. It is from 606 through 1866. And Martin Luther says this in this book, and Martin Luther had this understanding long before the Seventh-day Adventists came up. And Alexander Hislop taught the same in his book, The Two Babylons. And Henry Gretton Guinness taught the same in his book, Romanism and the Reformation. And I think there will be probably other Protestant writers that I'm not aware of right now who taught the same stuff. When God says, come out of her, my people, and as in Revelation 18, verse 4, that you, be not, that you do not partake in her sins, and that you receive none of her plagues, I think he meant not only the Roman Catholic Church, but he meant all apostate, quote-unquote, Protestant churches in the same way, all the daughters of the harlot in Rome. And by that, he also means the Seventh-day Adventist, if you like it or not. The truth is the truth. Until next time, Jogla 66 from O of the Truth says God bless you. Signing off then. Bye bye.
走。